Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome you to this uh, webinar um, hosted by INE. And uh, my name is Christian Stoff. I work for Education Cannot Wait as the head of MNE. And uh, I'm very pleased to, to introduce uh, you to this webinar and to the participants, uh, uh, the presenters. This is basically to give you an overview of the of the data challenges that we find in education in emergencies. We have very different uh, types of presentations and approaches. So this should be very interesting to give you an overview of the different initiatives that are un un uh, ongoing uh, for strengthening EAE data systems. So um, I will not talk long in the beginning. I will have some time to discuss uh, general observations at the end. So I will hand over to the first presenter, uh, Carly uh, from, from NYU TIS. She's going to present uh, about the uh, learning outcome measurement initiatives that, that they have put forward. So over to you, Carly, uh, without further ado. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity um, to present today. Um, next slide. So I wanted to start off, um, I know that we use the terms data and evidence and measures, um, even, even in the abstract um, for this panel. So we use those terms a lot um, and we sometimes use them interchangeably. Um, but I wanted to take a minute to step back and think about what each of these components actually are um, and how they're related to each other. Um, and doing that so that um, both we can locate the work uh, that I'm going to be presenting on and hopefully um, locate the work of the other presenters as we come back and have a discussion about um, all of this. Um, so to do so, I pulled a framework um, from public health, um, which has thought a lot about this data to evidence pipeline, um, primarily in the context of evidence-based medicine. Um, you can see the citation at the bottom of the screen and happy to share that as well after uh, the presentation. But foundationally, according to this framework, data at the bottom of the pyramid uh, data are numbers or symbols or text as they were retrieved or collected. So as an example, the number of, in our work, the number of Arabic letters identified, um, the number of days of class attended, I feel sad. Um, a subset of that data is then transformed into evidence and information. Um, so there's an asterisk there because this framework actually makes a distinction between evidence and information. Um, for the, our purposes today, I'm going to put the two together um, and uh, say that evidence and information is data in context. It is data that has been aggregated, analyzed, and presented to provide um, understanding, or to test hypotheses. And so, for example, moving from the number of Arabic letters identified to across our sample, 27% of kids at baseline could not read a letter of Arabic. There's an aggregation function. Next slide. But the thing is, there's many different ways that the data can be aggregated and analyzed. Um, and how that is done um, is based on how you want to use that evidence. Um, so ideally, before any data is collected, you sit down and say, okay, this is how I'm, I'm envisioning using this evidence so that you can be sure that you collect the data in a way that is fit for purpose. So for example, you may want to provide evidence um, of how um, children are performing against global learning goals. Um, and so monitoring progress against global learning goals. That's something that requires um, more of a population-based sample, um, as well as the ability to compare between different samples. You may want to provide evidence about how well programs are working, so an evaluation function. And that's something that requires potentially uh, multiple waves of data and potentially data collected from different groups. So a control group and an experimental group. You may wanna provide data that just describes the needs um, of children and use that information to make decisions about what to do next. And so that's data that might be more fine grained to enable that type of decision making. But 
main point is that whatever you're, you're using that evidence for, it has implications for what the data sh needs to look like. And then going one step back, it also has implications um, for the methods that are used to collect the data. So for example, in order to describe needs, you might need to use a measure that's pretty short uh, or a survey that's pretty short um, that can be collected from a lot of kids and analyzed quickly. Um, but in order to evaluate whether a program had an impact or not, you might need to want to use both a measure and a portfolio of kids learning throughout the year. So those decisions about what the evidence is for has implications for both how the data should be structured and about the method that's used to collect the data. The second piece is that um, there's uh, you need to make decisions about what you're collecting the data about, what the measures and methods that you're, you're using to collect the data, what they're picking up. Um, and so, for example, we've been talking a little bit about literacy, but say you want to provide information about how well kids are doing. So how are you defining how well? Um, what, what are the components of, of wellness in that context? And so that's where um, these underlying frameworks or standards come in. And so frameworks or standards, if you think about potentially the CASEL, social and emotional learning framework or curriculum standards, they're ways that we structure and organize how we think about the world, how we process information, how we communicate. Um, so for example, if you think about a national education system who has profiles of skills that children should achieve by certain grades, um, ideally, you would want to be able to measure those skills, collect data on them, and then report on the percentage of children performing at or above a certain level for those skills. Um, and I realize at this point I have not moved the slides along. So actually, if you could um, keep going. Uh, right there. Perfect. Sorry about that. Um, so that's the this pyramid is sort of the ideal where you have um, frameworks those are aligned to measures that leads to data some set of the data becomes evidence um, but we know um, in the context a lot of the context in which we work that this is the um, not the ideal and so oftentimes what you'll have is a bunch of different frameworks coming in from NGOs from governments from uh, you know, uh, more global actors. And so those are proliferating. Those are not necessarily linked to the measures or the interviews or the observations that you're collecting evidence. Sometimes that does lead to data, but sometimes, or you're collecting data, sometimes that does lead to evidence, but sometimes the data just ends up sitting there, file door problem. And then when you do have evidence, it's unlinked. It's, it's across all of these different um, uh, sectors, um, and you have a data set here, a data set here, um, and so it ends up being a pretty fragmented picture of what's actually going on. Next slide. Um, so what I, I'm going to talk about today is an effort um, that we have been working on at NYU Global Ties, um, as well as with colleagues um, in Lebanon to try and bring some alignment and coherence to this process. Um, and we're focusing on a very specific part of this pyramid. We're focusing on the frameworks, the measures, and for today, just getting a little bit into the data um, that we're gonna, uh, that I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, next slide. And so just to say a little bit more about the context in Lebanon, um, Lebanon uh, is a country that has gone through tremendous uh, uh, adversity and conflict in the past 45 years. So starting with the, the Lebanese Civil War, um, going to the, the conflict with Israel, um, and then the Syrian Civil War. Um, and then of course, most recently, um, the political revolution, um, uh, COVID and um, the economic devastation. It's also a country that is tremendously diverse. Um, it's home to 18 different uh, religious sects that are coexisting in, in a very small country. And it's also a country that has demonstrated tremendous resilience throughout all of this. 
Um, and in particular, for example, um, the Lebanese Ministry of Education in the Syrian uh, influx opened up its national education system to refugee children, um, which effectively doubled the size of the formal school population within four years. Um, and that's uh, something that has actually never um, happened before, even um, with some of the school enroll enrollment um, uh, efforts in Africa in the mid 90s. So that was a tremendous um, effort on the part of the government. Um, as part of which, and even going back to the Lebanese Civil War, there has been a big focus on children's psychosocial and social and emotional well-being. And because of that, um, and the number of NGOs operating in the country, there have been a proliferation of all of the frameworks that have been used to define social and emotional learning. Um, so uh, back in 2017, um, as part of uh, the 3EA measurement consortium, the government of Lebanon and World Learning joined the consortium in, with the goal of developing a social and emotional learning assessment. Um, and with that, and over the next few years, we formed a research practice policy partnership to make progress on those goals. Um, next slide. Um, so what we use to actually um, develop that, that measure, um, the process that we're going through. Uh, it is called evidence-centered design. It's a process that was developed by the Educational Testing Service, um, and it's meant to provide a, a framework um, in order to develop a coherent assessment. Um, so it ensures that the way um, that the evidence is gathered from an assessment, that the data is gathered from assessment, is consistent with the underlying knowledge and purpose of the assessment. And so to do that, it's a mini version of what that, of what that pyramid was. And so you start by defining um, what do you want to be able to say from the data? Um, do you want to say that a program is working? And if so, what kind of program? Do you want to say that a child has X skills but not Y skills? What are those skills and what, what do they look like? Um, moving to the very right hand side, um, box number two, what are the observations that you need to collect in order to be able to say those things? What are the items or the tasks that will provide that information? Who needs to report on those tasks and how are they administered? And then moving to the box in the middle of the screen. Um, third, is there evidence that the data you collected actually measures what you think it's going to measure? And the actual, the likely answer to that question is kind of. Um, so it's very hard to design an assessment and have evidence that it's doing everything that you want it to do the first, second, third, 18th times you actually do it. And so that revision process is key. So that feeds back into your understanding of what it is you're measuring and why. Next slide. So what we've done in Lebanon is gone through, a, or we're going through a version of this process right now. So on the right-hand side of the screen, we worked with stakeholders to define the purpose of the assessment. In our work, it's a formative assessment tool. So we wanted to capture information about individual learners' um, strengths and weaknesses in social and emotional skills, and feed this information back to teachers to adjust their practices. Um, but at the time, we didn't know what skills we wanted to capture. There were so many different frameworks in Lebanon for social and emotional learning. Um, so we went through a process um, where uh, the government of Lebanon was trained on Harvard Easel Lab's um, SEL taxonomy coding process. Um, and so we actually empirically mapped across different frameworks what skills they had focused on historically, while also coming together for a consensus process of what skills they wanted to focus on moving forward. Which gets us further to understanding what we want to measure, but then we still needed to define what those competencies look like. And so right now, World Learning and the government of Lebanon are embarking on a, uh, a qualitative um, national study um, to ask students and teachers and parents and sub-regional stakeholders how they're actually defining these social and emotional skills. We'll use that information to further elaborate um, and, and build out our framework, draft framework, which you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, the next question is, next slide, um, is how we're actually going to measure the competencies we've defined. Um, so it's really hard to start from scratch and reinvent the wheel in terms of creating items. 
Um, so we've been working, um, my colleague Roxanne, who's on the call, has been working the past two years to develop an inventory of measures um, that have been used to assess children's social and emotional skills in the Middle East, North Africa, and Turkey. And those, a uh, version of that, a, a smaller version, is available on the INEE MENAP measurement library for download. Um, so that currently has about 230 measures. Um, and uh, a portion of which focus on social emotional skills. So uh, we're working to code those measures according to the Harvard SEL taxonomy framework so that they're actually linked back to our draft SEL framework and allow for easy selection of items to test. Um, so what we're creating is, next slide, um, an item, uh, next slide, uh, an item construct bag, bank um, in which the specific items in measures or tasks within measures are mapped back to the domains and subdomains in our framework. And that will allow us to create the first draft of the measure. Um, next slide. And so then we're gonna be working on a process with the government um, in which uh, we have a series of workshops, so psychometric workshops to design the assessment um, originally, this was intended to be uh, both student and teacher, um, but given um, COVID and school closures, we're working, actively working right now to understand how we can adapt that for um, distance assessment, um, which is going to be, which is going to be challenging, but also necessary. Um, so we're hoping to collect uh, a few waves of data, but hopefully starting in October of 2020. Um, and go through that revision or that analysis and revision process to feedback by spring of 2021. Next slide. And all of which is to say that, um, uh, you know, we hope that this is going to be a coherent process, but we also know that there are these feedback loops that need to happen in between each of these um, uh, elements of this pyramid between the frameworks and the measures and the data and the evidence. And so we also consider this a very dynamic um, and living process um, that requires a lot of coordination in order to make it work. Um, and so with that, um, just a big thank you to all of our partners and collaborators um, at World Learning and uh, Center for Education Research and Development in Lebanon, Ministry of Education and Higher Education. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and turn it over to the next presenter. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good, good Let morning. Let me just introduce Noura. Thanks a lot, Carly. Um, so we have uh, next uh, on Noura Nazir, who is the M&E advisor for FHI 360, and he's going to present, as you can see on the title, about an interesting uh, data initiative in Northeast Nigeria that they have led. Uh, over to you, Noura. Sorry for cutting no you problem. off. No problem. No problem. Thank you, Christian. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. I will be sharing experience on how FHI 360 is building a resilient and conflict sensitive subnational education data system in Northeast Nigeria. I have about 21 slides in 15 minutes. So help me God. Uh, next slide, please. All right, um, so FHR 360 is implementing a three-year USAID funded project in two Northeastern Nigerian states, Borno and Yobe. And uh, one of the key pillars, the result areas of the project is to um, increase the capacity of, uh, of education authorities to plan manage and oversee education services. Um, vividly, you can see that um, data is required in this uh, to plan to manage and oversee um, education services. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, this is how it all started. Um, we co-created dashboards together with the stakeholders who identified the data sets that they require for their planning and day-to-day -day decision making. So during the, uh, the consultative workshop, uh, we posed the question, uh, then what's left? They've, uh, they identified all the data they've been using so far and the data they would like to collect and to ask them what is left. Uh, so at that point, 
they realize they need much more data than just education statistics that they usually collect from annual school census. They need um, uh, to integrate um, education statistics with population data, security update because of the volatile nature of the region. And also they need to understand uh, where partners are, imp are implementing uh, for effective planning and management. Next, uh, next slide, please. So um, this is the schema of the data hub, the dashboard that we established, which uh, collects and analyzes data from a variety of sources, including the government, the humanitarian uh, and the developmental, and also security actors. Uh, so the data will inform a flexible scenario-based response that includes education sector plans, developing uh, sector response plans, to serve as an early warning system uh, from the data we are collecting at learning centers, which you are, you are going to see in subsequent slides. And then we also developed school safety and security plans um, that, the, that the, uh, as a project will help and establish and then build the capacity of education stakeholders to implement. Um, as you can see, Data, this, the key main sources of data uh, that go into the data hub, and then these are the outputs, development aid, um, as I just mentioned. Next slide, please. So this is the current reality in the states where we are implementing Borno and Yobe, in the Northeast Nigeria. Um, if you can see under the education development data, which is the Education Management Information System, system EMIS, um, you can see um, the challenge. The data is available, uh, but it's, it's difficult to access, sometimes it's incomplete, and then um, and most times they are not current. Uh, under, the, under the humanitarian data, um, there's a lack of consistent indicator definitions, lack of quality controls, and uh, you know, uh, lack of user-friendly um, visualization. Next slide, please. So, um, so this is one of the major sources of the uh, data for the dashboard, which is the humanitarian data, which comprises of four elements, education partner mapping, emergency tracking tool, displacement tracking metrics, and uh, the security tracker. Next slide, please. Uh, next. Okay, so this is an illustration um, of one of the dashboards. Um, summarizing all the data sources. You can see uh, at the top, you can see top left, you can see the partner and project presence. You can see the key figures summarized. Uh, you can see the emergency tracking tool, the displacement tracking metrics and the security tracker. So at a glance, it gives stakeholders uh, a holistic view, a high level um, aggregate of what is, uh, what is happening in the education sector. Next slide, please. So looking at them one by one, uh, we have the, the partner education sector partner presence. Um, if you look at the key figures, um, it indicates the active projects, uh, implement the number of organizations implementing those projects. As you can see, 63 projects at, the, at, the point, uh, at that point when this data is generated, implemented by 15 uh, organizations the number of children reached, the number of non-formal learning centers supported, the um, number of adults adults reached education services, number of formal schools reached, uh, number of teachers reached with training and so on. And then lastly, you could see the um, target population of the, of the region. Next slide, please. Then we have the emergency tracking tool. It shows, which shows the population movement in and out of local government areas, um, which is like a county. Um, so it shows how people are moving from one location to another. 
uh, due to either natural or man-made disaster uh, due to the conflict. So uh, the, obviously this will help um, the education managers, the education authority to, pl uh, to plan adequately, looking at uh, how the population movement is. Uh, in LGAs where you have population moving out of the LGA and then going into another LGA, which means, um, LGA actually means local government area. So, which means um, the, the, the education managers in charge of that local government area need to plan adequately. Next slide, please. Uh, then the, we have the, secure, the security tracker, which provides update on security related incidents and the dates where, when they happened, including the number of deaths and the location. Um, so again, this will help uh, the education managers and other stakeholders uh, to keep abreast to be aware of uh, the security situation. And that would definitely help while um, planning for delivering education services. Next slide, please. Then we also have, we have the displacement tracking, tracking metrics, uh, which provides information on the displacement, but at household level. It indicates the percentage of children that are accessing education despite the displacement, um, uh, the nature of delivery, how, the how they are reaching education services. Is it on-site? Is it off-site? Um, so this give us, gives us detailed information um, and then the, and then the um, emergency tracking tool. Next slide, please. So then our second major source of data from the, um, uh, for, the, for the dashboard, for the data hub, um, uh, which is the, the, the rolling assessment that the Addressing Education in Northeast Nigeria project is collecting directly from primary sources, uh, where we conduct a biweekly mobile phone survey to the teachers and the learning facilitators. Um, measuring students' learning outcome from the formal schools and non-formal learning centers, measuring uh, the fidelity of implementation, the quality, the safety, and other implementation data from, from the schools, from the learning centers. We also uh, ask about teachers' well-being, uh, their ability to lead their classes successfully. And of course, we integrated a community feedback, complaints and positive feedback. So this is a data that we collect on a routine basis from pri directly from primary sources. Uh, next slide, please. Next. Okay, so this is the screen uh, of um, one of the primary data that we collect as a project, which serves um, the biweekly mobile phone survey, which serves as, a, as an early warning system uh, because it provides update on violent incidents within within and outside the learning centers and also within the neighboring community. So we look at trends and uh, if there is um, uh, persistent um, incidents happening within a particular community, um, that indicates, um, that, that is an early warning sign. So uh, next slide. Uh, so this is a continuation of the um, data that is collected through the bi-weekly mobile phone survey that's twice a month directly from the teachers and the learning facilitators. Next slide. Now then the third, we come to the third um, major source of data for the dashboard, uh, which is the data that comes from the Universal Basic Education Board, which is a state level uh, education authority. Uh, where we intend to visit the required annual school census uh, questionnaire. Um, uh, usually that what they've been dealing with is um, education statistics. And so we have uh, reviewed that process, including uh, a review of the questionnaire and um, uh, we have a plan of, for digitizing the process uh, so that we could be getting data real time because one of the challenges we identified was that um, Data is um, data is always not available. Um, there's always a one year lag. So by digitizing the process, this is a plan. 
we uh, we hope to see a real time data available at all, at all time. Then we're also going to support the agency for mass education. This is dealing with the non formal uh, sector of education. Um, before now, at the states where we are working, the um, data um, the education data almost never exist in the in the non formal education sector so we are going to establish uh, a system like an emis system for the non formal sector next slide please uh, next Okay, so this is the sample of the uh, data that's been generated from the education management information system. Uh, however, like I mentioned, it's not always uh, current. There's always a one year lag or even more. So as you can see, the total population of the region of the state, uh, you have some classroom to people ratio, toilet to pupil ratio, uh, all those um, standard EMIS indicators. Next. Okay, teacher pupil ratio, enrollment, a number of teachers. Next slide. Um, so our plan for optimizing the utilization of the data hub, the dashboard uh, that we have established. In general, our goal is to promote a culture of evidence-based decision-making in the education authorities that we are partnering with, um, building their capacity uh, on data capture and utilization. And then uh, we help them, do, we're going to support them to develop education sector response plan. And then of course, we're going to do a hand-holding coaching to ensure they are using the data uh, for their day-to-day -day planning and decision making. We're going to be, uh, we are currently doing and we'll continue to coordinate with other state and non-state actors. And then uh, lastly, we're going to digitize the annual school census data collection, uh, both in the formal sector of education and the non-formal sector. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nora. Um, actually, almost ahead of time, so very impressive. Uh, let me hand over now to the next uh, presenter, uh, is uh, Ms. Uh, Camille Lai-Erg. Uh, she's the Associate Program Officer with the Section of Migration, Displacement, Emergencies and Education at UNESCO, and she's the focal point uh, for the, an initiative to strengthen EMIS and data systems for increased resilience to crisis. And she's going to talk about this initiative. So over to you, Camille. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. I hope the sound is okay. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, yes, my name is Camille Ayug. I work at the section of uh, Migration, Displacement, Emergencies, and Education at UNESCO. Uh, and I'm going to present some uh, work streams or uh, action areas uh, to adapt education management and information systems to emergencies and uh, protective crises drawing upon UNESCO's work, including the IIP, the International Institute for uh, Educational Planning. Uh, next slide, please. So first, a little bit of background. Uh, so the, the work streams uh, I'm going to present are drawn from an initiative that, uh, called uh, Strengthening EMIS and Data for Increased Resilience to Crisis, uh, which is funded by ECW and SIDA. And the first phase of, uh, of this project uh, consisted in uh, undertaking case studies in six countries. So Chad, Ethiopia, Palestine, South Sudan, Syria, and Uganda. Uh, the, the case studies examine existing EMIS and uh, recurring challenges related to education and the management and use of uh, information in, uh, in crisis situations. So they also highlight the gaps between EMIS and uh, humanitarian education data. And finally, they outline uh, a number of recommendations and uh, next steps to better support the national system in capturing uh, EAE data. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, and as part of this initiative, UNESCO will organize an uh, international conference on uh, strengthening EMIS and uh, EAE data in UNESCO HQ in uh, September uh, 2020. 
Uh, the dates are yet to be confirmed uh, due to the, the, the current pandemic, so uh, we'll keep you posted on that. Um, and also the, the work streams I'm going to present draw on uh, upon the IIP long-standing experience uh, in providing, providing technical assistance uh, to ministries of education in order to improve the crisis sensitivity of, uh, of EMIS. Next uh, slide, please. First of all, a, a word on, uh, on UNESCO's approach. Uh, lessons learned from our work show that improving EI data requires the articulation between reinforced EMIS and better coherence, coherence between uh, national and humanitarian data systems. Uh, it also calls for a holistic approach when it comes to data system, taking into account that data systems are comprised of people, uh, are an organization of processes. So moving away from an approach that solely focuses on uh, the infrastructure or uh, the technical or material aspects of data systems only. It also calls for um, a realistic and uh, incremental approach uh, that seeks to build on uh, existing initiatives uh, and promote complementarity. Uh, an approach that strikes uh, a balance between what data should be ideally collected and what can be realistically and safely be collected, given limited resources, competing demands, protection, protection risks, and uh, ethical considerations. Because we've seen that there is a tendency to think that sophist uh, sophisticated EMIS software can provide like quick fix solutions to produce uh, better EI data. Well, in fact, this can prove unsustainable due to a lack of capacities and, uh, and resources from the national authorities to operate and maintain uh, such systems in the, in the long run. So actually, there, there are many activities that can and, and should be implemented to improve uh, EA data and that are complementary to uh, EMIS upgrading interventions uh, per se. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm now going to present these, uh, these key areas and, uh, and related work streams uh, we have uh, identified in order to, to strengthen the MIS and improve the coherence between uh, with um, humanitarian education data. Uh, a little disclaimer first is that uh, the idea is not to generalize to, uh, to all contexts, but to provide uh, a presentation of, uh, of a set of activities and guiding principles that need uh, to be actually adopted to, adapted to country contexts. The first uh, stream is uh, strengthening and linking institutional frameworks around EMIS, data, and EIE. Uh, legal policy and uh, institutional frameworks for EMIS on one hand and uh, for EIE on the other uh, are a necessary part for creating an enabling environment for improved data collection. Uh, our case study uh, show clearly that the absence of crisis sensitive elements in national data EMIS strategies might result in the absence of, uh, of collection of crisis uh, related indicators. So we can also ensure that, um, that uh, crisis related data needs are reflect reflected in, uh, in national policies and frameworks, as well as institutional uh, responsibilities and, uh, and structures, including for uh, EMIS. We can also improve uh, the, coheren the coherence between national and uh, humanitarian education strategies, including with respect uh, to, to data and to data, uh, which must uh, feature in these uh, strategic documents. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in particular to education sector plans and uh, cluster stra strategies. Uh, finally, we can make sure that the, uh, of the involvement of both uh, humanitarian and development partners in the design and review of the EMIS uh, slash data frameworks. So that was for the first stream. Second uh, stream is, uh, of course, uh, uh, improving coordination across humanitarian and uh, development sectors. Uh, so all, uh, all case studies are reported that coordination is uh, one of the most uh, striking challenge when it comes to EA data. Uh, and here are some examples of activities uh, that we can undertake among many others. First of all, we can improve uh, mutual participation in coordination mechanism, including around the uh, data, uh, and ensure participation of both humanitarian and development partners in EMIS related processes. Uh, another action can be uh, to undertake 
<coughs> apologize, uh, EAE data mapping at national level uh, to make to, um, to to better assess who collects uh, which data and uh, for what use. We can organize workshops uh, for better integration and interoperability between the, the different data systems at country level. Um, <coughs> in order to, to harmonize data, uh, the collection and management uh, relying on common practices, common indicators, common methods, um, um, common, uh, I mean, common uh, data sharing protocols. Uh, we can also make sure that we use um, unique school IDs across I mean, both uh, sectors, uh, uh, including uh, from national authorities, uh, humanitarian uh, uh, sector and development sector. Uh, another and uh, another action can be to undertake uh, joint data uh, collection and assessment with participation from national authorities, humanitarian and development par partners, uh, jointly defining indicators to be collected and on how and who co will collect. Um, next slide, please. Um, a third stream is to reinforce capacities and ensure adequate funding with an emphasis on the human, the human component of capacities. UNESCO's work shows that it is critical to invest uh, in human and technical capacity for uh, info information management and data collection, analysis, dissemination and use. And this includes also uh, capacity uh, uh, among the humanitarian partners and uh, the customers. Because without sufficient human capacity, uh, data systems can be uh, over uh, donor dependent, not sustainable. Um, yeah, not sustainable. Um, a fourth work stream is strengthening uh, the Ministry of Education leadership in data collection and use. And that's uh, the, the main focus of uh, IIP's work. And also, this goes uh, with the last point on, on, point on capacity. Uh, it is critical that there is buy-in, ownership, and leadership from national authorities so that EA data is considered as a priority, including uh, at the preparedness phase, and that there is con continuity between the emergency to, through uh, recovery. This can be achieved uh, through um, sensitization of technical staff on the, on the value of data to support crisis uh, preparedness and response, or sensitization of partners on the importance of uh, uh, strong EMIS and uh, national data to improve the overall quality of EI data, as EMIS is part of this uh, EI data ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, a word on uh, what can be done at, uh, at global level, and um, which also reflects uh, the, the approach that UNESCO, including IIP, uh, will invest in. We need to uh, build the commitment, momentum, and common approaches across uh, the humanitarian and development tech sectors. We need to develop and deploy um, global public goods in EAE data uh, and the EMIS. This can be achieved uh, through uh, development and, uh, and deployment of uh, common guidelines, common methods, uh, um, common indicators, such as the one I is developing, um, common protocols, etc. We also, we also can uh, invest uh, in research, communication, and outreach. And the uh, next slide, please. Um, that's it for me. Uh, thank you for very much for listening. Please uh, do not hesitate to, to reach out to us uh, with, uh, with the emails that you, you can see right now on the screen. Uh, yeah. And uh, passing over to you now, Christian. Thank you, Camille. Um, now the last presenter is uh, Nicolas Servas. Uh, he's uh, he works at the Global Education Cluster as Education Cluster Coordinator, and in particular emphasizing education needs assessment. And he's going to talk about the Global Education Cluster role in supporting education needs assessments. Uh, so over to you, Nicolas. Thank you very much, Christian, and everyone. Uh, we'll start just with a few words of presentation of um, you know what we'll uh, talk about in the next few minutes. Uh, we'll have a um, quick words, uh, just a quick overview of the role of the education cluster in the global uh, humanitarian coordination system. Then look um, at the main challenges that education clusters are, are facing in humanitarian situations. Um, then the work that we have done um, at the global level in support of um, 
of country education clusters in terms of uh, developing tools uh, for needs assessment analysis. Um, then looking more specifically in, into the work done in the first uh, six months of this year, again, you know, from a global perspective, but in support of country clusters, and then some general ideas about, you know, how we could work collaboratively for improving uh, EAE needs assessments on data systems. So next, please. All right, uh, as I mentioned, like just a few words about the, you know, where we stand as a cluster in the humanitarian coordination uh, uh, globally. Um, in 1992, there was a General Assembly resolution uh, to establish um, a humanitarian coordination system that's called the IAC, as you can see there. And the IAC is, you know, comprised of the mostly head of humanitarian, uh, sorry, UN agencies involved in uh, humanitarian response, but also uh, federations um, and the uh, councils uh, of uh, NGOs and Red Crescent, uh, Red Crescent societies. And the IAC is a primary mechanism for interagency coordination of humanitarian assistance in response to complex and uh, major emergencies. And the cluster approach was uh, a sort of created, set up a, a few years later in 2005 uh, as part of the humanitarian reform agenda. Um, and I think what's very important to, to understand there is that you know, the main goals of the humanitarian reform agenda were to enhance predictability, on counterity on partnership and they were mostly you know it was as a result of the 2004 crisis in Darfur where the response was very slow but also um, what I would describe as a you know rather um, complex response um, in the in the Indian Ocean with a, with a tsunami as for education uh, as you can see on the on the diagram on the right you know we are one amongst the 11 sectors and we are the only cluster that's collated by both uh, NGO and UN organization. We can move to the next. All right. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the role of the cluster is to um, foster, to facilitate leadership coordination at the, in, of your interim response at the global level. And one of the key roles, as you can see at the top of the diagram, is to facilitate need assessments and analysis. Um, with a primary goal uh, is to inform and shape what we call humanitarian needs overviews, which are um, mostly you know, led and facilitated by OCHA and the intercluster system at the, at the country level. But then also this will help inform what we call the humanitarian response plans. And that includes defining number of people in need of humanitarian assistance and also the funding uh, asks. We can move to next. Um, now, you know, I mean, why the, the global education cluster developed put tools on its supporting country clusters in the area of needs assessments. Uh, it comes from the, the fact that um, separate education emergency actors typically don't have enough financial human resources to do countrywide assessments of uh, education needs and gaps. Uh, and, you know, as a result of our all role also to uh, strengthen coordination, leadership of human response, we have to identify, analyze, and disseminate information on the education status of needs of IDPs and host uh, communities in the countries where the cluster system in, is uh, activated. Some of the most common challenges in, uh, in doing that uh, when you're working at the country level is uh, the lack of a reliable baseline, um, um, UNESCO previously mentioned the issue of uh, MSCs. As you can imagine, in crisis context, conflict context, or protected uh, crisis, MSCs is often uh, outdated, incomplete uh, in terms of uh, geographic coverage. Uh, so it's one of the main challenges. Another one is a uh, low number and lack of capacity of partners to support with uh, data collection analysis, uh, sometimes lack of funding, uh, and obviously also in a crisis context, uh, security and logis logistical challenges in accessing some of the most affected areas. Areas. Next, please. All right, so then, I mean, you know, looking at these conditions and challenges, uh, what the global education cluster has done in the past few years, it's work that started, you know, from the beginning of the, of the, of the GEC in 2007, but maybe that, you know, became more practical as from 2010 and even more in the past few years. Um, we have developed a number of tools, one that was uh, sort of revamped last year, uh, used to be called the JENA as a Joint Education Needs Assessment Approach, is now called the Coordinated uh, EAE Needs Assessment. Uh, and basically it's about um, providing, you know, comprehensive and flexible, uh, applying a comprehensive and flexible approach to needs assessment at the country level. It's something that can uh, cover an entire country, but also can be disaggregated um, in terms of uh, age groups, education levels, thematic issues in, in education. Um, the approach we apply 
most often is the in terms of methodology primary data collection is mostly based at the facility level uh, however other approaches uh, can be used uh, and its main goal is to inform education cluster strategies and uh, HNOs. There are a number of other uh, approaches, you know, we are fostering, uh, encouraging, but just the, the only other one I'm mentioning here is the harmonization of partners assessments. I think we have heard before, you know, a number of actors presenting the, the work that they are doing in different countries. Uh, the, the cluster can work with these actors, uh, sort of, you know, before they do the assessments on, uh, yeah, in, you know, in the sort of uh, information definition phase of the assessment towards harmonizing the indicators for the greater good of uh, every, every actor on the human response in the country and that also includes uh, ministries of education so that would consist indeed you know in harmonizing the, the indicators uh, but also then compiling on analyzing them at the uh, education cluster level with the support of uh, partners um, now sort of moving beyond the actual uh, assessment tools one program we developed last year it was a pilot uh, that was done in Libya and Nigeria 2019 is uh, we developed a coaching program for country education cluster teams uh, based on the, the needs assessment package I, I referred to before uh, and it's mostly based on um, uh, safe learning so there is a, a guide that uh, country teams can can follow but it goes also with uh, videos concrete examples but also remote and in-country support by uh, coaches uh, and I'll show some examples of that uh, later in the presentation next please here I'm just, you know, I thought it would be good to, to show you what are the main phases and we can quickly go through it. The main phases of uh, an assessment or um, yeah, needs assessment structure um, at, at, uh, at the country level. Obviously, you know, we start with identifying the information needs, uh, then um, going into secondary data review, uh, looking at the information that exists and the information gaps. Uh, and then as a three, you can see this uh, joint education needs assessment. If you move towards the left, uh, sorry, the right, then you can see the different phases of the, of the GENA. I'm not going into details, but basically it's, it's mostly about um, primary data collection analysis and then writing your report and, and sharing your report. Uh, it's important if we go back to the left, you know, on points four, five, uh, not to see this necessarily as, as something that's uh, linear in terms of timeline. Um, as you can guess, the harmonization of need assessment can take place um, before you engage in any primary data collection analysis, and same with the engagement uh, uh, of in the multi-sectoral need assessments. We can move to the next one, please. Here, um, I thought also, you know, it may be helpful to look into one example amongst many others of uh, what uh, an EIE, sorry, education cluster type of need assessment uh, look like. Um, just to, you know, to show you some of the information that's collected. Uh, this was done in South Sudan in 2017, if I'm not wrong. So of course, you know, we, we start uh, with describing the methodology, but then in terms of findings, there is a heavy focus on the functionality of schools. So, you know, are schools open, closed, for what reasons? Uh, based you know, on, on the key informants, mostly uh, head teachers, um, education directors, what are the, you know, the priorities for the reopening of schools? Um, and then you know, some of the school characteristics in terms of infrastructure, washing schools, etc. And then going into the, the status of um, students and teachers, their enrollment, presence in the schools, um, the attendance, the dropout, um, etc. There are just a, a few examples. Uh, we can move to the next, please. All right, I, I mentioned, I think, uh, just like um, two slides before this one, uh, you know, the collaboration with other actors, multi-sectoral assessments. We are not um, doing work on our own only. We collaborate with, um, you know, at the country level, obviously, with uh, the education cluster partners, the different organizations, working um, both from a development on the, on the humanitarian perspectives, but also at the global level, we have a strong um, uh, collaboration with two uh, big actors. One is REACH. REACH is the organization who's uh, um, leading the, at the country level and also global level what's called uh, multi-cluster slash multi-sector needs assessments as a the, the title very well described you know education is not the only sector represented in, in these uh, assessments uh, but you know we have a, a, a good number of um, indicators in the assessments um, the information is collected mostly or actually uh, so far uh, only at the household level so that's quite a, a difference from uh, our own GEC tools on you know the, the tendency we have maybe to favor um, 
uh, sorry, uh, facility-based assessments. Um, and uh, the role of the country education cluster there in this process is mostly to revise indicators, maybe a little bit of the geographical coverage. So there is a dialogue between country education clusters on reach on, on this assessment. But the data collection on the analysis is done by reach. Uh, another um, global actor that we are strongly collaborating with is the IOM uh, displacement tracking metrics. They have a number of tools, mobility tracking, size assessment, surveys, and irrespective of our collaboration with them, uh, IOM DTM does collect um, information slash indicators on education as we could see in some of the previous uh, presentations. Uh, however, IOM uh, DTM on the global education clusters develop separate specific tools, mostly geared towards uh, defining the severity of conditions uh, of IDPs in relation to different uh, uh, sectors, but in our case, education. Uh, the big difference with the uh, MSNA is that uh, there, even though data collection is done by AUM DTM, the analysis should be done by country education cluster. So it requires some capacity to, to be able to extract and uh, analyze that. We can move to the next. Um, now, just looking at the past six months' work, and I have to say here, uh, obviously, COVID-19 has had a you know big impact on what we are doing. I mean, or most importantly, on the way we are doing things. Uh, but some this work, you know, had been uh, planned already from. Um, late 2019 and we we're able to to adapt quickly um, mostly because we had already planned to do a lot of uh, remote support uh, what happened if you refer back if you um, think about the, the the coaching program i i mentioned earlier what we realized in late 2019 early 2020 is that um, this is quite a demanding program it requires three to four months uh, time commitment from the different clusters and we realized that um, country colleagues you know needed maybe a more flexible modular approach so we are supporting the, the countries you can see there uh, with maybe like, you know, on, on the smaller topics like secondary data reviews, uh, review of technical issues such as a review of indicators, questionnaires, supporting them with analysis. Uh, so maybe, you know, something that's smaller than a comprehensive needs assessment, but that's uh, maybe is more fit to their needs, but also a time availability. Uh, we are nevertheless continuing with the coaching program on expanding actually in uh, four countries. Uh, there is a four, fourth one still to be defined, uh, but so far it's quite sure. I mean, Burkina Faso uh, on Yemen will have the coaching program. Maybe Ethiopia will be a, a, a bit uh, lighter, um, but it's also something that's going to be uh, slightly more modular and lighter than, than what we did uh, last year. Um, we are also, you know, strongly encouraging country education clusters to collaborate with REACH and IUN DTM at the country level in terms of the tools I, I mentioned before. And I, you know, going beyond what we do from a global perspective, I have to say also that country education clusters are initiating leading needs assessments uh, irrespective of the work we are doing. This is the case for Bangladesh with the support of REACH. Colombia just, uh, they are finalizing an assessment with focus on COVID-19, and Ukraine is doing a remote assessment on a yearly basis. Uh, we can move to the next. Uh, and here I just wanted to, you know, to, to show you um, an example of uh, one chapter actually of the CCS coaching program with a focus on the secondary data review. You can see the different, uh, you know, sections about planning, designing, USDR, uh, doing the data entry and then going into the analysis, the report writing. Um, and you can see the disaggregation of uh, all the actions needed for that. So basically um, the, the teams, you know, who uh, express interest for this uh, coaching program that uh, you know the actions they they have to uh, implement, uh, and for each action there is a small paragraph in the guides. Sometimes, as you can see, there are some uh, videos on YouTube uh, on what you can see as leads uh, tier one, tier two. They are mostly. Um, different levels of participation at the country level. You know, tier one are the people who are most involved. So the uh, country education clusters, IMOs, coordinators on tier two are more the, the, the partners who, who are provided documentation and sometimes populating also the, the SDR. This is one, one example amongst the much more comprehensive um, coaching program uh, package. Um, on the last slide, and uh, yeah, I mean, there are just some thoughts, you know, in relation to what has been discussed before, including by the other presenters on maybe, you know, uh, avenues to explore for, for long-term solutions, um, maybe thinking beyond our sector. Uh, I, I mentioned the integration of education in, in indicators in multi-sectoral assessments. This has been uh, ongoing for, for years now, uh, but there is now a stronger focus on the intersectoral tools. 
uh, there is something called the JIAF, the Joint Intersectoral Analysis Framework, uh, where education is represented, uh, but with a goal of indeed, you know, defining uh, numbers uh, on severity of people in needs beyond our own uh, sector. But uh, education is uh, used as one of the several uh, indicators. Um, also, when I say, you know, thinking beyond uh, education, um, we should think about uh, other sectors input uh, into severity. You know, food insecurity, I think, is a very good one. Um, if you think about uh, famines on the uh, severely food insecure countries, the impact it has on school functionality, presence of teachers, uh, and of course, attendance of uh, students. On the last point, uh, is also linking with the uh, you know, UNESCO uh, work on EMAIS um, to stress that uh, without uh, availability of data on support, I have to say in all the work we are doing, we are uh, really striving to collaborate with ministries of education uh, on the number one tool we need in order to do all this work I described is the EMAIS, you know, that's the, uh, our baseline. Um, I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention, over. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, uh, and all presenters. Uh, we are all actually two minutes uh, earlier than an anticipated. Uh, so thanks for being concise in your presentations. And let's open up the, the, the question and answer session. Here first, uh, a few points uh, from my side uh, 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 to discuss some observations from me. Uh, looking at the presentations and, and listening to you, I think uh, a key, key highlights, I would say, is, uh, is the need for holistic uh, approaches to, to all data issues. Carly was mentioning the, the need of assessment systems to be really aligned with existing frameworks in the country, uh, to, to, to look at curricula and the alignment uh, to, to the assessment system, textbooks and so forth, teacher trainings. Uh, so this was a key aspect. Then also EMIS systems, the linkages to the, to the uh, needs assessment uh, and learning outcome assessments so that you create basically through these different data sources, one coherent data set that uh, data users can, can look at. Um, one uh, question there is though uh, uh, that I had is uh, when you look at the solutions that were presented, there is a sort of one element that is about developing the tools uh, and, and sort of the more technical element. There's the capacity development work that Nicolas highlighted uh, from the global education cluster. But sort of there are questions of how do you create actually the incentives uh, for, for, for the community on the ground really to work in an integrated way so that the data that is produced is then used for, uh, has the purpose that basically there's a continuity of the tools that are de being developed. There's funding perhaps allocated uh, sort of that requires uh, elements like advocacy, sort of uh, uh, mobilizing the, the community of donors also on the ground, government, of course, as, as the lead, lead uh, institutions in the countries, sort of uh, how can we move towards these holistic approaches that also look at advocacy and sustainability? So uh, after highlighting some additional points, it would be great to hear from, from uh, Carly, for example, how, how, how would this work continue or from, from the others as well, from Nura and so forth. So uh, I hear a message, okay. Uh, yes, I'm trying to turn on my video, but uh, it says the host has stopped me. So, ah, start my video. Okay, here I am. Um, now, that would be one, one question that I had. How do we move towards more holistic approaches that in incorporate all elements of, of sort of an intervention strategy to improve a data system and the use of that data. The other question uh, and observation I had was there was a highlight also from Nicolas at the end, uh, working towards uh, uh, comprehensive uh, data systems that capture different elements, sometimes also not related to only education, but also protection, health and other sectors. Now, while education in emergencies and emergencies uh, as, as such create a diverse set of needs, not only education, but uh, linked to it like uh, health issues, like uh, protection issues. So we do need integrated solutions. 
Uh, but when you look at assessments that are geared towards collecting data on all these different issues, there are many actors that need to coordinate to make this work and to also program then in the end towards that. What are some of the challenges that you, you find, for example, with, with uh, joint education needs assessments and also moving towards multi-sector uh, assessments? How do you capture data for the different sectors that is uh, not just a few questions that uh, that are in in the end not useful for the education sector, but something that is useful for the education sector, but highlights also the linkages to these other uh, sectors. And I think Nura also would could could highlight perhaps since this EMIS system that he produced looked at these various aspects uh, in there. So what were the time challenges actually of getting all the actors behind it so that they will also use that data. Um, then uh, we heard also the issue of fragmentation uh, in, in what, uh, what Camille presented, uh, many of the case studies, and we had several discussions on that all, also because that is actually also an ECW funded uh, initiative. So a lot of interaction that we had and we we had discussions on the fragmentation so that oftentimes in, in the case study countries, we found that many different actors were involved in, 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 in data collection, sometimes duplicating uh, these, uh, these uh, um, uh, different uh, data collection initiatives. So how can we actually move towards a more coordinated approach? And on one side, uh, this is like that. Uh, there's a tool development, but on the other side is we need a sort of coordination mechanisms that really bring all actors together. And at the moment, there's still a bit of fragmentation there with refugee coordination mechanisms, with uh, education EIE sector coordination mechanisms. There's also development actors, uh, uh, humanitarian actors, and sometimes decisions on funding projects are really still like an interaction between uh, the, the funder and actually the implementing agency. And then at the same time, agencies themselves have their own framework and their own headquarters where they basically work together to develop these solutions. So in all this ecosystem basically that, that we have, how can we move actually in uniting and working uh, across these different uh, coordination mechanisms towards one coherent uh, strategy uh, that, that, that can be put forward. And perhaps Nicolas can talk a bit about the, 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 the global partner project where actually UNHCR is working together with, with a global education cluster and INE to work towards these more uh, uh, holistic and comprehensive, well-coordinated systems. Um, last thing perhaps, uh, what I would highlight is is the the perp the role of purpose driven solutions. So, how can we make sure that all the data is really being being used uh, for for programming? And how can we see that this evidence, this better evidence, leads to also better programming? Uh, what we see sometimes. Uh, when from ECW side, when we receive uh, proposals, oftentimes there's an extensive like um, uh, set of analysis of what the, the issues are in a country. But then oftentimes the response uh, is, is, is actually more a standard response and sometimes takes not, doesn't take into account actually the assessment findings. So this goes then into a question in emergencies, we need to act quickly and, uh, and we need to, to provide the response uh, quickly enough. So working on very elaborate tailored solutions that take into account the assessment data, there's a strong need for that data to be really user friendly and, and visualized well so that the uh, pro proposal development uh, uh, actors really can understand the main issues and can develop the proposals uh, quickly uh, quickly enough and, and for equally for the government. So very interesting was Nura's presentation also on sort of the visualizations and, and Carly's presentation. So uh, what was your experience in these visualizations? How could, how did they drive actually then uh, uh, programming on the ground and, and what are some lessons learned there? Uh, perhaps last thing I would also highlight sort of how can we as an EIE community basically develop in this 
still a bit fragmented uh, situation that we have. How can we bring the actors together? And uh, we have been uh, uh, working with, with INE and the different actors around the data and evidence collaborative uh, around the idea of an EIE uh, data, data group. And these discussions are ongoing basically to move where the health sector is in a way at more advanced already towards establishing some, some common standards globally and principles around M&E uh, and, and, and data for, for education in emergencies. So this is, uh, we feel, a, a promising initiative. So what would be, I think, important standards that, that the presenters uh, feel uh, need to be there for actually this fragmented approach to move towards a more coordinated approach. Uh, this can, standards could include, for example, the role of inclusiveness. Uh, I think Noura mentioned that uh, non-formal institutions are included. I think that's a great step uh, to, towards making sure that all the crisis affected populations are included. When you look at UIS data, for example, even though the SDGs have actually under equity uh, a separate target on uh, having conflict affected uh, uh, sort of uh, children included, there's still issues that uh, there's a lot of blank data, a lot of data gaps in, in, in the development data sets. So how can we actually through as an EIE data community in, in move towards uh, an, a data set that is more inclusive of crisis affected children? So these are ideas for some standards and, and uh, we will be working with, with the EIE data group on that and all interested people here also, you can reach out, uh, I guess, to INE and, uh, and, and to ECW to, to get some information about that. So here are some observations that I gave uh, and questions to the presenters. I've seen uh, a lot of questions and answers are already being answered. Uh, I'm just going through it now, but maybe over to Sonia also and, and, and presenters to, to respond to some of these uh, questions that I raised and some of them that, uh, that were raised in the question and answer section of, uh, from the participants. Over to you. Who wants to start? Uh, shall I hand over Carly, perhaps in the order of pre presenters? Sure. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, so just to touch on, I think, your, your first question to me around um, uh, how do you create incentives to use and also a few questions that had come in through the chat about the capacity building process. Um, so I think those two are inherently related to each other. And I think what we, the process that we are engaged in with the, with the government in Lebanon has been driven by the government of Lebanon. It was a need that they identified. And I think our role in that has been um, to listen to what the needs are and to help pr provide different supports um, to get them to the place that they want to be. Um, and so it hasn't been coming in with a, a new solution or um, uh, to reinvent the wheel, but to really just bring to get together the capacity that is already on the ground. Um, and I think the key to that has been the ability to establish relationships. And I think that that is so often underlooked in what is funded in this work. Um, but those relationships are what is driving the use to the point that even in, in COVID, so um, we're no longer able to travel to Lebanon, but the stakeholders in Lebanon are champions for this work and are driving it forward. Um, and so um, I think our biggest lesson learned that we can't emphasize enough is the need for those relationships and that capacity development. Um, process in order to make sure that the data is used at all levels. So we're working with the government, but involve, hoping to involve the teachers and the students in that process to make sure it's sustainable. Thanks very much, uh, Carly. Uh, over to the next uh, presenter. I think that uh, was, uh, let me see on the order. Uh, uh, yeah, Noura. All right, um, thank you, Chris. Um, so for AENN project, um, one of our result areas, one of our key pillars, um, I've talked about building the capacity of education authorities to plan, manage, and oversee. So that's one pillar from the supply side. And then, so on the demand side, we're working with um, 
community organizations, community groups. And one of the strategies we adopt is uh, like a feedback loop. Whatever data we are collecting from the community, we ensure that that data, uh, the analyzed information gets back to uh, to the communities in um, in an attempt to uh, to incentivize, so to speak, and then uh, make them create more awareness and then demand for more services from the supply side, from the uh, education authorities. Um, I don't know whether I need to move to the next question because they are related. They're all related about the challenges of on utilizing data by the actors. Of course, the community groups are also part of the actors, but our first, our, our, our major focus is of course the, um, the education authorities. Uh, you all agree with me, this is a, this is a behavior change that would take, uh, that would take some time. Uh, uh, people are used to doing uh, business as usual the way they, but the good news is while we were we were developing the dashboard um, like I mentioned in my presentation um, it was co-created with the stakeholders so they came forward and they they identified the, the kind of data they require for their day-to-day -day decision making and some strategic planning and then we guided them to say, okay, so what is what is uh, what is what is missing, and that is when they realize, okay, we we need an integrated um, uh, data, uh, a, a dashboard that would uh, highlight all the um, all the all, all the aspects of um, um, that that affect education education programming in a crisis settings. So the population movement. Uh, the security updates um, and so on and so forth. So uh, our plan for that is, like I mentioned, um, is to, uh, and I also like to mention that uh, our dashboard was uh, launched not long ago. It's it's still at the initial stage, and so we are working hard towards uh, make ensuring that uh, it's been optimally utilized by the. Uh, by, the, by the major actors. And we plan to do that by um, engaging, embedding um, uh, persons with uh, uh, institutional capacity building expertise and also with some management information system background. Uh, so we will embed them into the ed education education authorities we are partnering with so they will continue to mentor and coach them that a, a hand holding process um, be like some data champions um, working with them on, on on almost a daily basis um, making sure they they appreciate uh, the data they, they have the data the data, the dashboard that's already been established and they use use, use the data in their day to day decision making so this is our our strategy, our short term strategy, embedding somebody within um, from the team, from our team, within those education um, authorities, and then do a hand holding until they begin to optimally utilize data and information for decision making. Uh, Nora, can I ask a follow up question from, from one participant in the question and answer section? There's uh, Infinix Note 6. Uh, <laughs> in rural areas where I live and work, strengthening data management systems for local governments is critical. So there's a question on uh, having crude sort of manual equipment, and you presented, I think, all these dashboards and you talked about mobile phone data collection. And in, in these internet challenges that rural areas face, perhaps you can highlight just very shortly, as we have little time, uh, on, on some of these uh, lessons learned that you had from, from your work in Northeast Nigeria. Okay, so I think uh, in my response, I indicated that at the moment, our dashboard is um, established at the state level. So the next plan is the expansion going to the local government level. So we have done an assessment of physical infrastructure, of course, accessibility, uh, the security, you know, and uh, and human human resource capacity for those LGS. There are in the two states we're working. There are forty-seven 
local government. So with, and then after the assessment, we realized um, about uh, 39 are still, access, uh, are still accessible. So um, we have a plan already we, uh, that informed our procurement plan. And so we're procuring equipment, um, uh, mostly will be uh, solar, solar energy because of course we know that the, the, the problem of power is always, is, uh, is, uh, has always been a, a challenge. So, and then we have, uh, we're going to um, also, also uh, provide in internet access because as long as um, part of the assessment is whether there's a telecommunication service within those local governments. So as long as we have services, we should be able to provide internet services. And of course, uh, the most important thing is the, uh, the accessibility, the security. So we have a plan, capacity building, training on, uh, of staff at that level. Um, that is the next phase we're going, going into. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Noura. Maybe over to Camille, uh, if you can highlight a few points on the fragmentation and how, how perhaps uh, your way forward of what are your suggestions and uh, I know there are uh, potentially future phases of this initiative. So how would you address these things and any other questions you, you would like to address, of course. Over to you, Camille. Um, thank you. Um, I think in general, I mean, we need to have an education system-wide approach vis-à-vis uh, -vis those issues, so taking into account the many uh, actors that are involved in data collection, uh, including, of course, the national authorities, which plays a, which play a, an important role. We also should keep in mind that all contexts are different, so the needs are different, and so uh, settings are different. Um, that uh, these are long-term processes and that bridging the nexus will not happen tomorrow, um, that uh, this takes time, um, that it needs to... Um, um, to invest uh, importantly in those uh, in those things, and that there is more there is a need for more dialogue and more partnerships at uh, at local level, uh, making sure that both sectors uh, get together, because I think so far the the architecture of uh, of the different coordination, coordination mechanism is not fit for uh, uh, for those things. Um, so yeah. I think uh, having a comprehensive approach, uh, making sure partnerships and dialogues are, um, are, are taking place. Um, yeah. I don't know if that responds to your question. Sure. Uh, perhaps uh, Camille on the, there was an, a question here on integration of uh, needs assessment uh, data. Uh, from IENAS into EMIS and sort of the EMIS uh, adopting a broader definition perhaps where it's it's basically an ecosystem of different data sets mm -hmm. and it's integrated and moving away from this more traditional uh, sort of a school census uh, EMIS uh, based on only uh, very few indicators. So yeah. is there sort of a, a plan towards establishing that? It depends on, uh, on, uh, on each country and the willingness of, uh, of ministries of education and humanitarian partners uh, at, uh, at national level to do so. Uh, but indeed, there is opportunities uh, to, to align both uh, needs assessment and uh, EMIS data. But need, this, this needs, uh, for instance, uh, we can have some uh, workshops at, uh, at national level deciding on how, um, what are the definition of ind uh, indicators, the data to be collected. To, to make sure that there is an, an alignment between uh, what is collected by EMIS and the needs assessment. So this is uh, done through a coordination exercise, uh, but this is not uh, impossible. If you have uh, data that which is comparable, um, you can, uh, you can uh, use both sources of, uh, of, of data um, to analyze a, a certain issue. And uh, EMIS is, a, yeah, is, is broader than a questionnaire um, actually. Um, yeah. Okay. So it, it needs to be. Um, it needs to be. Um, it's an ecosystem that needs to evolve and uh, uh, as as we progress. Uh, and that's why dialogue and partnership is very much important to understand what are the needs of each actor and how can EMIS can respond to those needs, and how also uh, EMIS can benefit from needs assessment. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Camille. Maybe for, for Nicolas to take up that question also and some of the previous ones. And then there was a question in the qu question and answer section 
on uh, coordination of res EIE research agencies uh, and sort of in terms of what they uh, plan in terms of their initiatives in the different countries. I think a lot of the coordination in countries is about agencies programming different things, but perhaps that research side of research agencies, how actually they their uh, sort of initiatives coming up and sort of mapping that perhaps through INE could be an interesting solution. Perhaps Carly could highlight some ideas on what uh, coordination mechanisms research agencies in that field would come up. Perhaps you could follow after Nicolas and then I think we would end uh, soon uh, uh, this, this, this call. Okay, over to you Nicolas first and then Carly. All right, <clears throat> thank you very much. Yes, indeed, I thought you know, it would be a very good follow-up um, uh, in terms of coordination between GENAS, so uh, education cluster-led assessments on EMA, EMAS, sorry. Um, indeed, it is feasible, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, when we do uh, education cluster needs assessments, we very much involve ministries of education from uh, the definition of uh, information needs, but also data collection on the on analysis, and then of course revising the, the report. It, more practically, trying to link with the uh, image systems, you know, we can also think about uh, uh, situations on that has uh, taken place. At least um, when I was in South Sudan, we initiated uh, some, you know, collaboration on collecting data for uh, the Ministry of Education uh, uh, MS uh, in areas that they, they could not access. You know, so we had, uh, for example, a um, you know, series of workshops on their information needs on how we could try to integrate that in, uh, in our um, uh, needs information uh, systems. Um, yes. Maybe on the, uh, Christian, you had to raise the point also on, you know, are we, you know, you, you, you said that there are multi-sexual needs assessment systems, but are we really multi-sexual and are we using that information? And I think it's a very valid point uh, in the sense that it's true, you know, we can have this sort of uh, unified collection of information, you know, analysis done by, by one partner, but it's true that looking at the different, how the different sexual needs interact with each other is not necessarily done uh, so far. Uh, that, that's why I mentioned this uh, GIF, the Joint Intersexual Analysis Framework, which is, um, you know, has been work in progress for the past three years. But indeed, this, um, the, the, the objective of this uh, tool, this methodology is to go beyond sexual needs and to look at how how different sectoral needs and gaps interact with, uh, with each other. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Maybe to you, Carly. Um, sure. Um, on the research agencies and coordination of, and so that people on the ground know what's coming and what's being in, in the pipeline. <laughs> Um, so if, if I'm, if I'm reading the question correctly, it's who can be the coordinating mechanism for this data and measures and evidence, um, and then the research that's coming out of that. And so that's where that um, framework, that, that pyramid is helpful to me in thinking about that piece. One of the things I think we've seen um, is that the, the country level, the Center for Education Research it, within the country potentially as should be the holder of that information and that capacity that brings together all of those different pieces. And so I think um, a strategy of, of capacitating that entity within the country um, can be helpful. And um, having this sort of conversation about what are all the pieces that need to come together. Um, I think part of what's been interesting for me today also is um, to think about the, the right now, the disconnect between learning outcomes in MS systems and uh, how you can bring those two together and what's required to do that. And that seems to be a link for education systems um, that's going to be important. So I think to the extent that we can bring together the amazing tools that have already been developed in MSs with this measurement capacity, um, is going to be critical in terms of making these more holistic um, data systems. All right. Uh, yes, thanks. I think we are now exactly time is up, uh, I would say. It was, I mean, to me, a very in interesting discussion and I hope you found it also enriching. Uh, this discussion, uh, yeah, will hopefully continue. Uh, I mean, through hosted by, by INE. And in particular, I want to highlight this EIE data reference group that we have, uh, that we are gearing up for. 
And the importance is that basically it has the different voices of different agencies so that we truly uh, address the issues that we find on coordination holistically. That means not only agencies but all, uh, that are programming, but also research agencies. And really as a, as a tool of, of reflecting on stronger research practice partnerships, I think, which are, which are key in the future. So these are just some closing remarks, uh, but thank you to, uh, to all of you, to all the participants who, who listened in, and of course to all the presenters uh, who, who, who gave great presentations. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, see you soon in another webinar.